Hello and welcome to CNBC TV 18. I'm Shireen Bhan. This is our special series, The Bad Medicine. The Indian government has launched a probe into four cough syrups manufactured by Haryana-based Maiden Pharma. This after the World Health Organization issued a global alert last night saying that the use of these four products could have potentially caused the deaths of 66 children in Gambia. The WHO says that lab analysis of samples of each product confirms that they contain unacceptable amounts of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol call as contaminants. As per sources, the WHO alerted the Indian government about its findings and government sources say the drug regulator has launched a probe into the matter. They add that as per a preliminary inquiry, they find that the company has exported the concerned syrups only to Gambia so far. Now, Maiden Pharma, the company in question, claims on its website that its plants are WHO certified. It lists a certain Dr. Naresh Kumar Goel as the MD. The website says the company started its operations in the year 1990. Now, DG contamination is a serious threat and one that has unfortunately led to fatalities in India for the past several decades. It has also led to fatalities in many parts of the world. To talk about the epidemic of DEG poisoning and the regulatory lapses that need to be plugged, we will be joined by Dinesh Thakur, public health activist, and Prashant Reddy, lawyer by profession. Both of them have co-authored a book which will be launched soon called The Truth Pill. The book analyzes the actions of institutions that are responsible for the safety and efficacy of the Indian drug supply system. Before I get uh, Mr. Thakur and Prashant Reddy into the conversation, let me go across to my colleague Ekta Batra on the developments that have taken place in the last 24 hours. Was Ekta, what is the World Health Organization saying and has the company in question responded to the charges? The World Health Organization has issued a medical product alert indicating that four cough and cold syrups made by Indian-based private pharma company Made in Pharma could be potentially linked with serious kidney injuries and deaths of 66 children in Gambia. The WHO has said it was conducting further investigation with Made in Pharma and regulatory authorities in India. WHO has also recommended all countries detect and remove these products, though so far it has been detected only in Gambia. They could have been distributed to other countries. The Indian authorities, such as the CDSCO, too have acted fast and taken up the matter of Made in Pharma immediately with concerned state regulatory authorities and a detailed investigation is launched in collaboration with the state drug controller Haryana. The reason for these four cough syrups, which could have caused over 60 children dying in Gambia, is likely due to the drugs containing unacceptable amounts of the toxic substances called diethylene glycol or DEG. DEG is a solvent which is present in numerous formulations from brake fluids to paints and chemical preparations. It is a highly toxic organic solvent that causes acute renal failure and death when ingested. DEG is not used to manufacture cough syrups, but the contamination arises mostly if the company is manufacturing the drugs uses a low-quality industrial-grade propylene glycol for the cough syrups, where DEG is one of the impurities. Hence, pharma companies need to ensure they are using propylene glycol, which is as per pharma standards, hence safe. Industrial propylene glycol contains high levels of DEG and if substituted in pharma products, can be toxic. While there could be other factors of contamination, such as an overall faulty supply chain, this is probably the most common one, especially when it comes to cough syrups. Lastly, DEG contamination are not new, with cases recorded since the late 1930s. Globally, for India, DEG contamination has been linked to 14 children dying in Chennai, 21 fatalities in Mumbai due to the drug administered containing 18.5% of DEG. In 1998, 36 children between 2 months to 6 years were affected by acute renal failure as a cough drug manufactured by a company in Gurgaon was found to have contained 17% of DEG. 33 of these children died. And as recently as two years ago, in 2020, 17 children were hospitalized with renal failure and more than half died after being administered cold best PC cough syrup, which contained over 30% of DEG. Ekta, many thanks for joining us. That is uh, where we currently find ourselves with respect to this particular issue of DEG poisoning. To talk about this issue and take this discussion forward, we're now joined by Dinesh Thakur, public health activist, and Prashant Reddy, lawyer by profession. Both of them, as I mentioned, have co-authored a book, The Truth Pill. My colleague Ekta also with me. Mr. Thakur and Prashant, many thanks for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. It's good to have you back. 
Uh, you know, I have to say, uh, I got an advanced copy of your book, Mr. Thakur, on Monday. I began reading it on Monday. And yesterday, when the news broke, uh, when the WHO put out this global alert, I have to say I had a visceral reaction, a physical reaction, because the prologue of your book talks about the epidemic and the regulatory failure when it comes to DEG poisoning. Dinesh Thakur, let me understand from you, why did you feel the need to address that issue at the very start of your book? Uh, and in many ways, is it symptomatic of the lapses that continue? Um, thanks, Shireen. Um, and thank you again for this opportunity. Um, over the three years while Prashant and I were writing this book, we never thought that you know, we would start our, our book marketing campaign on such a ghoulish note. But here we are. Um, I remember talking to you five years ago, five years ago, about you know, the regulatory lapses you know, within our regulatory framework, and nothing seems to have changed. The reason why we have picked the, you know, this incident in Jammu two years ago, where Ekta talked about the fact that this company uh, called Digital Vision which sold cold best PC syrup contained 33% of dietylene glycol. Um, that essentially was, you know, the, the most sort of, you know, uh, I, what do I, what, how would I characterize it? Just probably a, the worst kind of situation where children, young children, as young as seven months, six months, succumb to, you know, uh, acute renal failure because of this particular syrup that was contaminated. The worst part about this is that it's been two years now. Nothing seems to have been changed. Um, yes, the, the Himachal Pradesh uh, state drug regulator made all the right noises saying that we will do the investigation as Haryana is doing today. The CDS here said that they would also do something about it. But here we are, two years now. What has happened? Has the company been held liable? Has um, anything changed as far as the manufacturing process is concerned? Has the CDS here put out any report that tells us why is it that, that this, this adulterated syrup was administered to these young children? We see this pattern repeating time and time again. I mean, just like just a few hours ago, I saw a tweet out by the uh, All India Association of Ruggers and Chemists saying that this company only exports you know, to overseas uh, countries. They don't sell anything in India. That's a bold-faced lie. Go back and look at the excellent database that the CDSCO runs. There are multiple instances of this company's drugs failing in India, in, in Gujarat, in Kerala. I don't even know where to start. The reason why we picked this particular instance because it is probably symptomatic of the callousness, the responsibility, the complete lack of accountability of the drug regulator when it comes to our medicines drug supply. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, several important issues being raised there. And, uh, you know, I, I want you uh, to read out to our viewers an excerpt from the book. And as I said, uh, you know, this is the prologue of an over 500-page book which addresses the issue of DEG poisoning, an issue that has now been red flagged by the WHO uh, in the last 24 hours. It says India has the uniquely depressing record of having had at least five major DEG poisoning events. The first took place in Madras in 1972, killing 15 children after they consumed the cough syrup called Pipmol C. And then, of course, it goes on to talk about, uh, as Dinesh and Ekta were mentioning, uh, the incident in Jammu, uh, which uh, was the fifth, in, in your words, uh, Dinesh, Thakur and Prashant, the fifth case of mass poisoning uh, in India on account of DEG. Prashant, let's address that issue. At the heart of the matter, one of the big challenges seems to be that there are multiplicity of regulators involved. In this case, for instance, uh, it is the state government regulator that seems to be uh, supervising, that seems to be overseeing the operations of this company. Uh, it is now the national drug regulator uh, talking to the state regulator. Uh, and that seems to be at the heart of many of the other violations that Dinesh talked about, including the one uh, uh, of 2019, uh, the, the last case of DG mass poisoning that we saw. Is one of the biggest challenges, one of the biggest issues that we need to address the multiplicity and the lack of coordination of regulators at the national and the state level? Absolutely, Ms. Bond, you've hit the nail on the head. So this has been a problem from right from 1940 when the first drug regulatory law was being drafted in colonial India, where uh, the idea, the, the, the challenge was on who exactly is going to be in charge of drug regulation. Today, we've landed up in a system where India has a common market for sell, buying and selling drugs. So a drug manufacturer in Himachal Pradesh can reach, you know, Tamil Nadu and Mizoram within a 
span of uh, a few weeks. But when it comes to regulation, we have a very convoluted system. We have a federated regulation uh, regulatory system where each state has its own regulator. Plus, we have a central regulator that looks after imports and certain other activities. Uh, and what happens in such a federated regulatory system is that it becomes very difficult for coordination, interstate coordination. So if you speak to drug regulators down in the South, uh, who actually do a pretty good job, uh, they'll throw up their hands and complain that they can't do anything against a Himachal Pradesh a pharmaceutical company because it's the Himachal Pradesh drug regulator that issues a manufacturing license. The only thing that, say, a drug inspector in Tamil Nadu can do is to criminally prosecute that company, but that criminal prosecution takes its own sweet time. A drug inspector in Tamil Nadu cannot even go and raid the, uh, uh, the manufacturing facility in Haryana without Haryana Himachal Pradesh without the cooperation of the local uh, uh, drug controllers. So you have a system where even states which are interested in cracking down uh, cannot do anything because most of the manufacturing happens in certain excise-free zones in Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. And, uh, and because those state governments are not interested in cracking down on the pharma industry, uh, we continuously see incidents like this. Uh, Mr. Thakur, there seems to be a cultural issue as well when it comes to India, and I want to get your thoughts in it. Uh, the fact that we are extremely compliant when it comes to global uh, developers, the US FDA, the European regulators, biosimilar approvals, cancer drug approvals such as Revlimid generic, but on the other hand, there are issues such as these that crop up in the domestic pharmaceutical industry. Do you think that there is some amount of a cultural issue which stops us from compliance and enforcement when it comes to domestic pharma? Well, culture responds to regulation, right? I think that the bigger issue that we have is that over the last 50 years, we've engendered a dual standard of manufacturing. We comply with the stringent regulations when we export our medicine overseas, right? Many of our um, manufacturing facilities are US FDA compliant. So we can do that. The problem here is that, that you know, when you have two different sets of standards, one for export and one for domestic use, and especially when you know that the comp level of compliance and the level of accountability is sorely lacking when it comes to our local consumption and to export in, into countries where they don't really have a really good regulatory system. Like, we see this in Africa. These kinds of incidents happen, right? We see this in, I mean, Vietnam blacklisted a whole bunch of our drugs um, a few years ago because, you know, they found out that they were substandard. These companies would never dream of doing that to Europe and United States because they know that they have to comply with stringent regulations there. The question, I guess, we have to ask is that why do we encourage, allow, or why are we satisfied with two different set of standards, right? The same companies that make this product for export comply with a stringent standard, but when it comes to actually you know, delivering it for our own, our own people here, or to countries where there's not enough, you know, a, a, strict, a stricter regulation, we, we, you know, we fall uh, you know, over ourselves you know, and try and cut corners. So it's a culture you know, comes from you know, the way that the uh, regulations have been written, and for far too long, far too long. We have closed our eyes. We have always said that we want to encourage an industry to try and, and, and be competitive in the world. We, we don't want to put any shackles around it. Ease of doing business is, is, is you know, touted as the more important thing of the regulator than protecting public health. So that's where the culture comes from. Mr. Thakur, what I want to address here with you specifically on this issue, and I, I think that's, uh, that's something that both Prashant and you were talking about, you know, one, of course, is uh, compliance with good manufacturing practices as far as the manufacturing facilities are concerned. The other, specific to this challenge, this scourge of DEG poisoning, seems to be one of supply chain regulation. Now, how much of a lacuna, how much of a vacuum do we find ourselves when we talk about supply chain regulation, specific to the pharma industry. Mr. Thakur. So, so you cannot separate out supply chain regulation from good manufacturing practices, right? For example, GMP says that when you get raw materials delivered to you, which you use in your manufacturing, you do your testing. You know, you make sure that, that the raw materials that you're getting are of a certain purity, certain standard, right? Nine out of ten times when we run into situations of this nature, 
we find out that, that you know, the company that actually has made uh, adulterated product, substandard product, they have not tested it properly. That is GMP, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, my heart goes out to this, you know, the, the, this, this uh, parents of the 66 children, that, that someone will have to explain to them that the reason yeah. why they had poison in their cough syrup was because some company decided not to test their raw materials. How do you do that? Mm. It's as simple as that. And that is what GMP yeah. is. GMP basically yeah. says that you follow these set of standards yeah. and practices. Unfortunately, you know, our regulations and our compliance is horrible when it comes to this. Yeah. One, of course, is the law itself, and the other is the enforcement with standards and regulation, two different things entirely. You may have uh, laws on the book, you may have regulations on the book, but then enforcement is a different story altogether. And Prashant, that's where I want to come back again to state capacity specifically. As Ekta was pointing out, you know, over 3,000 pharmaceutical companies, that's the number that we have, over 10,000 manufacturing facilities. Do we even have the capacity, especially at the state level, to be able to enforce? Oh, no. That's a simple answer. We don't have it. And it also varies across states. So one of the, uh, I mean, one of the findings of this book is that some of the southern states actually do a pretty good job, uh, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and Kerala especially. At least they test and they do try to prosecute few of these guys. But in a lot of other states, the the state of, you know, the, the testing laboratories is just shocking. Like Bihar just doesn't have the basic testing equipment. And that's a state of more than 100 million people. Similarly, Himachal Pradesh, which is the hub of manufacturing, pharma manufacturing in India, because the government has given them uh, an excise-free zone over there. The lab in that, uh, they have only one testing lab, the state government. And when we filed an RTI application asking them about what kind of tests they were doing, it turns out that they weren't doing some of the most basic tests. So that's the problem. If As long as we leave it to state governments, we are going to have this, you know, differentiated system of regulation across the country. The only way we can try and fix this is by trying and centralizing regulation. In most countries in the world, if there is a common market where drugs can flow from one state or one province to another, there will be a common federal regulator which is uh, setting standards and enforcing the law. And also, let's remember that the central government generally has a lot more money to spend on, on drug regulation. For state governments, drug regulation comes right at the bottom of its list of priorities. Okay. Uh, Mr. Reddy, you know, I, I think you would be best placed to talk about the fact that what exactly is the stringent punishment or the punishment that exists right now if in case there is a substandard or spurious drug found by your company per se in India, uh, according to what I've learned, it's around 10 years of imprisonment and a 10 lakh rupee fine. One, do you think that it is imposed? And two, uh, is that the case? And uh, what is the sense from a legal perspective? Does that need to be become more stringent? Does that need to have more teeth in order to create more fear in the system for compliance? See, well, for cases like adulterated drugs, such as this particular case, which would qualify as an adulterated drug in Indian law, uh, in 2008, the law was amended to uh, allow even for life in prison for people uh, found responsible for manufacturing adulterated drugs. But the bulk of the quality problem in India is substandard drugs, right? So these are drugs which may not kill you, but which may not work and hence have an adverse effect on your health. So for those kind of cases, the law is actually quite lenient. It says minimum one year imprisonment, maximum two years. But what we discovered, and this was absolutely stunning, that in several states, including in uh, Karnataka, Maharashtra, and Tamil Nadu, where drug inspectors do prosecute these cases quite vigorously, even when companies are found guilty or when they plead guilty, the common sentence given by judicial magistrates is simple imprisonment till the rising of the court and a fine of about 20,000, 40,000 rupees. Now, simple imprisonment till the rising of the court sounds exactly like what, what it means. That is, if the judge gets up for lunch, you're free to go home after you pay your fine. So this is, we are treating the pharma industry with kid, kid gloves. Mm. It's just shocking that this hasn't gotten more attention in the past. 
which is why, unfortunately, these kids in Gambia are paying the price for our country's incompetence. Yeah, that is, uh, uh, you know, it is, it is unfortunate, it is tragic, it really is a travesty uh, that we've seen fatalities uh, continue, not just in India, but in, in the world as well. Of course, uh, you know, in, in your book, you uh, talk about the many instances of DG poisoning. 1937 in the U.S. is where it started. South Africa, 1969. Nigeria, 1990. Again, 2008. Bangladesh, 1990 to 1992. Argentina, 1992. Haiti, 1996. Panama, 2007. But India, uh, we've seen uh, DG poisoning cases from 1972 all the way to 2025 cases of mass poisoning of a DEG. But, uh, Mr. Thakur, let me uh, come back to you now uh, and address this very issue that Prashant was talking about. Uh, in the case, the last case of DEG contamination, DEG poisoning, uh, the Jammu incident that we talked about, uh, the company in question, as per the data put together in your book, there were more than a dozen violations that were flagged uh, by regulators at the state level, different states, not the state regulator in question. Even in this case uh, of, of this company uh, in question, there have been other state regulators that have red flagged this company in question. And yet, there doesn't seem to be any action. You filed an RTI as well uh, to try and understand where the regulatory process seems to be. No response? Well, I mean, as Prashant said, right, you know, getting either the state drug regulator or the central regu regulator to, to act in a transparent manner is like pulling teeth. It never happens. Um, we found 13 instances of this company being cited for making not of standard quality drugs in the government's own data. There was one, um, a journalist report that actually found 19 of them. And because, as you know, government data is incomplete. Only three states report to the national database. Uh, there were 19 instances where you know, this company was found you know, to be manufacturing not of standard quality drugs. But that didn't stop you know, the government from uh, the Himachal Pradesh drug controller from, from yanking out their manufacturing licenses right before they made this poisonous syrup being administered to young kids. Not just that. You know, it's been two years, as Ekta said. right? It's been over two years right now. What is the consequence? I mean, you can always blame the judicial system to say, look, you know, our, our courts languish you know, because you know, we don't prosecute in a timely manner. But the evidence here is it's black and white, as it, as it gets, right? It, it's a question of intent. It's a question of you know, the drug regulator acting on behalf of public health rather than promoting ease of doing business. Unfortunately, that's what our drug regulators do today. They talk about ease of doing business rather than protecting public health. And so nothing changes. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this. I mean, you're doing a great program today. A few, you know, uh, a few days from now, a week from now, this is going to be off the air. Everybody's going to forget about it, and we'll go back and do their own thing. Medicine regulation is not you know, anybody's yep. priority, and unless there is political will to try and change the system, nothing will change. That was the reason why we wrote this book. We wanted to yes, uh, get this data in front of lay people of the country yeah, I, I agree with what you say, Dinesh Thakur, but, uh, uh, you know, here at CNBC TV 18, as you know, we've been running bad medicine, putting the, uh, the spotlight on some of these issues for the last several years. And, of course, Ekta does a weekly called The Medicine Box, which also puts the spotlight on some of these uh, issues. But, uh, uh, you know, we do hope that... The, and at this point in time, for the benefit of our viewers, all we know is that the Indian regulator, the Indian drug regulator and the state regulator are now probing this issue issue or looking into the issue of maiden pharma, what we're given to understand at this point in time, and there is no uh, conclusive uh, sort of statement from either the company or from the government or the regulator to say that these uh, cough syrups uh, have not been administered in the Indian market, what we're given to understand that they are unlikely to have been available in the Indian market. The WHO, of course, in its press release has said that so far the identified drugs have been identified in Gambia, but through informal routes 
they may have found their way into other markets so they have asked regulators around the world uh, to uh, to pull these drugs from the market if they do identify them but that is where this story uh, stands at this point in time we will of course keep you updated on how things develop Dinesh Thakur Prashant Reddy uh, thanks very much for joining us here on this conversation as I said it's an awful coincidence uh, I wish we I wish we didn't have to talk about this uh, uh, as we talk about your book but uh, thanks very much for joining us here today that's it then on this special edition of the bad medicine uh, we will see you again uh, shortly till then from all of us here on CNBC TV 18 goodbye thanks for watching Thank you.